and welcome to session two. Uh, yesterday, if you remember, we did in session one, uh, we touched on the following topics. We talked about two I difference of axial length. Uh, we talked about two I differences in keratometry readings. And we also talked about the maximum cutoff limit for a very steep cornea or a very flat cornea for the premium lenses. Here I present it to you the case four. And in this case, uh, you can see uh, this patient uh, was uh, uh, implanted with a multifocal lens and uh, the aisle power was seven diopters. Uh, so if you go into the axial length, and unfortunately I do not have, uh, the two eye biometry was not done in this deep cases. And as I said, in session one, two eye biometry needs to be done because in Otherwise, we will not be able to compare between the two eyes, you know, the axial lens, the keratometry readings. So in this case, only the one eye biometry was done. And if you see the axial lens, the axial lens is quite, uh, you know, big. It is uh, 20, 32.50. So it's a, it's a very high um, uh, axial length. And in these cases, there's one challenge that you can, you may come across and more often than not, with so high an axial length, there's often the challenge of staphyloma, the posterior staphyloma in very high myopic cases. And we know by posterior staphyloma, we understand in such patients, the anatomic axial length and the, uh, and the refractive axial lengths are not matching. So in these cases, we need to rule out posterior staphyloma especially if we are if we want um, uh, to implant a premium IL in these cases because if we are because the patient expectations will be very high and we cannot afford to run into a refractive surprise so what is the incidence of posterior staphyloma very old paper in 1971 but you know uh, old is gold and it kind of gives us an idea about what is the incidence of posterior staphyloma as a function of the uh, axial length. And you can see beyond 26, 27, 28 millimeters, the incidence of axial of posterior staphyloma is very high. And uh, beyond 30, 31 um, millimeters of axial length, the incidence is as high as almost half, you know, uh, or half the patients um, with as high axial length as 30, 31 millimeters. Now, if you do not do a B scan, if you do not have a B scan, how would you understand that this patient may have a posterior staphyloma? That's my question over here. Or for example, if uh, by any chance your, uh, you know, the uh, B scan um, has not been done, you will understand that this patient may have a posterior um, segment anomaly if there's a very inconsistent axial length readings. If the standard deviation of the axial length readings are very high, then you may be almost certain that this patient may have a posterior segment anomaly. For example, if you go into the optical biometry machines, the optical biometry machines when it gives you an axial length reading at the background, it will have five different readings, the average of which it gives as one number. So if you go back into the lens star readings or the IL master readings, you need to see the standard deviation of the axial length readings. And more often than not, the standard deviations will be very high in such patients. So one of the signals that the patient might have a posterior staphyloma is that very high standard deviations. So in case four, what we understand is that if your patient has an axial length uh, of more than 26, 27 millimeters, do not rule out the chances of the patient having a very high posterior staphyloma. That needs to be ruled out before we implant a premium IUL. Now, since we are talking about very high myopic uh, patients, uh, we are talking about very high axial length, I thought of uh, discussing this uh, uh, case study with you. This patient has an axial length of 34.61. Uh, th this patient has an axial length of 34.61 uh, over here. I'm trying to find out my cursor once. 
So uh, when we did the, uh, the the biometry, the Barrett asked us to, you know, Barrett is asking for a minus five lens. And uh, however, with the other formulas, if you see over here, Hollet 2, Haggis, Hollet 1, Isakati, they are all saying that if you put in minus five lens, the patient is going to go for a myopixel price. Now, which formula are you going to choose over here? The Barrett is saying go for a minus five. All other formulas are saying, no, don't go for a minus five. If you put a minus five, you're going to have a myopixel price. So that's the dilemma. So what do we do over here? One of the things that can be done over here, and if you are on, you know, uh, uh, doing this, uh, if you have your patients very high HLN, what you can do is a Wang and Koch optimization. So Wang and Koch uh, optimization uh, can be done on very high HLN patients. When this paper was first presented, uh, the Wang and Koch uh, paper suggested to do uh, the optimization on patients who are having HLNs of over 25.2 millimeters. And uh, I did an optimization over here, holiday one optimization. This is the formula. I did the optimizations. Remember the patient had 34.61. That was the patient's HLN. I did an optimization, 32.96. After the optimization, the patient's HLN is now 32.96. Now see what is the IUL recommended against holiday one. So the holiday one against the 32.96, the holiday one is recommending now to put a minus five lens. What did the Barrett recommend? Remember Barrett recommended a minus five lens while all other IUL formulas were recommending not to put a minus five lens. But when I did a Bang & Cock optimization, holiday one is asking me to put a minus five lens. Similarly, the SRKT, when I did the SRKT, remember the formula for the holiday one optimization and SRKT optimization are different and the formula is over here. So when I did that SRKT optimization, the new axial length, the modified axial length is 33.27. What is the lens form, uh, lens IL power uh, that the SRKT is now asking for? Minus five. So now, both holiday one and SRKT are asking you to put a minus five. So what is the lesson learned? If you are not using a Barrett formula, if you're not using a, um, a fifth generation formula, if you're still using a two variable formula, it is important to do a Wang and Koch optimization for these formulas. And you might ask why? And the reason is that, remember, these are two variable formulas. And in session one, we discussed about these two variable formulas. If you have not watched the session one, I'd request you to go back to session one and, and uh, watch the session one where I discussed about the two variable formulas and how it can be impacted by very short axial lengths and very uh, long axial lengths, right? So the lesson learned over here, again, I repeat, is that if you are not using a Barrett formula, you can do a Wang and Koch optimization for these two variable formulas, right? Now, uh, one of the uh, papers that was actually presented in 2018, this paper uh, further studied the efficacy of the Wang and Koch optimization. And the Wang and Koch adjustment, this paper, according to this paper, works best when the patient's axial length is 27 millimeters and above. So when the Wang and Koch optimization was first brought in, I believe it was for patients for more than 25.2 millimeters. But according to this paper in 2018 that was published in the JCRS, it is asking for us to do an optimization beyond 27 millimeters. So any patient having an axial length of 27 millimeters and beyond, you can do a Wang and Koch optimization. So that's rule five, uh, doing a Wang and Koch optimization. Also, it's important maybe to do a B scan to rule out the posterior staphyloma. Now we have been talking about HGL lens, right? What would be the choice of the formula when the HGL length is high or when the HGL length is short? What about the corneal power? Does the choice of IUL calculation formulas depends upon the patient's cornea 
And this was a paper which talked about it and it showed us that if you are using the SRKT formula, you might run into a refractive surprise with a very steep cornea or with a very flat cornea. So in a very flat cornea, as you can see over here, very flat cornea, the refractive surprise is often hyperopic. With a very steep cornea, the refractive surprise is often myopic here. However, the Barrett formula, it seems, uh, was less susceptible to errors in case the patient's cornea is too steep or too uh, flat. Other formulas that also worked well with regard to the corneal power readings is the holiday one. It, uh, it is a two variable formula, but it seemed that it is less susceptible to two to refractive errors with two uh, steep corneas or two flat corneas. Right. Let's look into case six, one of my favorites. Uh, you know, uh, this patient again was chosen for toric lenses. And my personal request is that, you know, we should always check the patient's refraction wherever a manifest refraction of the patient is there. We should always check the K readings with the manifest refraction, especially for clinics where the torics are just started to use. I mean, you have not been doing torics, you have just started doing the torics. It's very important to relate it to the manifest refraction. I understand in not in all cases you have a manifest refraction, but in cases where you have a manifest refraction or the other eye refraction, you can always compare that. Why? If you see this case, the K1 45.5 diopters at 180 degree, 42 diopters at 90 degrees. So it's a it's a, against the rule astigmatism. If you look into the refraction, it is a with the rule astigmatism. Clearly here, the manifest refraction is not matching the K readings. I do not remember whether it was a manual keratometry or an auto keratometry done. I don't remember it very well, but it could well be a transcription error, error over here. The biometrician may have noted it down wrongly. So again, I repeat, the refraction is not matching the corneal reading. It's very important for us to match it. And the rule is that you're, if you are implanting a toric lens, try to see that your refraction and your corneal reading is within one diopters or 15 to 20 degrees in terms of axis. They should be very closely matching. They should not be, you know, if your manifest refraction is saying, uh, is uh, saying with the rule astigmatism and you get an against the rule astigmatism, then there's surely something going to be wrong and you need to recheck that. So the rule is that your K readings and your refraction should be within one diopters to each other and within 15 to 20 degrees to each other, right? The other thing that I noted over here is the refraction and the, and the uh, axial length are not matching. If you see the refraction over here, uh, the refraction is 2 point minus 2, the axial length is 22 diopters, which is not very matching, but I don't know. It could be because of the grade 2 nuclear cataract that this patient has, which is often called the index myopia. But definitely the K readings and the air refraction, manifest refraction is not matching here. So rule 6 is that we should always match the manifest refraction with the K readings. The other thing that I, I, this case very well points out is, is these, you know, you get data from your optical biometry, you get data there, but how reliable is that data? Before you look into the actual length, before you look into the K reading, how reliable is that data? And one of the things that IL Master 500 has the, the older version, it's it's now the Islemaster 700, but the version before this Islemaster 500 had was a signal to noise ratio. And this is very important to me. The signal to noise ratio actually indicates over here the strength of the signal as a function of the noise. So you don't, you want a very high signal. 
you know, uh, and not a very high noise. So the signal to noise ratio, you can see in this eye on the right eye, it is 320, which is very high. But anything below 50 is a very low signal to noise ratio, which is in the left eye. So can this data, before you look into the HL and the K readings, can this data be relied on? Now, the signal to noise ratio can be can be low in certain cases, for example, in posterior polar cataracts or subcapsular cataracts, maybe in patients uh, with uh, very hard cataracts, right, uh, brooms and cataracts, the signal to noise ratio can be low. And therefore, it is very important to not junk your ultrasound biometry machine because in these cases where the signal to noise ratio is less, you might want to go back to your optical, bi sorry, to your ultrasound biometry, do an immersion and check the patient's axial length. What you have with the, uh, with the current version of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is this uh, Isle Master 700, and I have been visiting one of the clinics over here. If you see this uh, the, on, the, on, on the left, uh, the patient was not fixating very well. What you see over here is that the foveal pit, the foveal pit is not visible. If you can see over here on the right eye, the foveal pit is visible over here. The foveal pit over here is visible. But on the left eye, the foveal pit is not visible over here. That means the patient was not fixating. So the, what it means is that your rays of light are not hitting on the fovea, but it, it is hitting somewhere else, and therefore you cannot depend on the axial length. The first thing that this, you know, this, this case shows us is that even before you look into the axial length, is this data reliable or not? You can see over here, the, the, uh, on the left, the foveal pit is not visible. The patient's Purkinje reflexes are out of the pupillary area. And then you can see a lens tilt over here, which is actually an outer lens tilt. Because the foveal pit is not visible, I can conclude over here that this Lens tilt that you are seeing over here is maybe not actually a lens tilt. It is basically the patient's head is tilted or the eye is tilted actually and not fixating. But on the right, if you see this, the foveal pit is visible over here. And that is what you can see over here. The Purkinje's reflex well aligned on the pupillary area. And then therefore this, ray, this line, this cross section of line going straight onto the retina over here. And therefore you can't, rely on this data right now where are those places where you may have a suboptimal you know the you know a reading and you may not have a very good reading and these are the places where you may not have very good re reading if the patient is not uh, not um, you know, looking at the uh, if the uh, at the at the fixation light, if the, if the 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 rays of light are not actually going onto the fovea, if there are corneal scars, pathology in the retina, for example, posterior staphyloma, very high amitropy of over six diopters, these are the places where you may not have very good fixation. So rule seven says that you know, before you look into the data, you need to validate the data. And one of the ways you can validate the data, for example, in Isle Master 500 was, is through the signal to noise ratio. One of the ways you can validate the data with Isle Master 700 is basically looking into the foveal pit and the, and the last slide that I showed you, the things to see. Similarly, if you go into the lens star or any other optical biometry machines, you will find out ways to validate the data. One of the ways is basically to understand the standard deviations. The standard deviations of the axial length, the standard deviations of the keratometry reading, these are some of the things that you need to actually look into to validate the data. So what are the standard deviations? If you look into these are basically my validation guidelines uh, uh, for uh, the standard deviations over here. Quite a bit of it, uh, you know, uh, and many of this I've, I have already covered. One of the things I would like to draw your attention is from my own experience, the standard deviation of the axis over here, the standard deviation of the axis, which should be always 3.5 degrees or less. The standard deviation of the axis should be always 3.5 degrees or less. So what do I mean by the standard deviation of the axis? If you see into this lens star data, the astigmatism over here, the astigmatism over here is, 
you know the uh, it is 6.5 degrees so that is that is beyond this data it has five readings so what is the standard deviation of those five reading axes it is 6.5 degrees which is virtually which is actually double than what is recommended right and i will talk to you about my own eyes to actually drive home the point that that i mean uh, you know for those all right i, I lost the slide over here and uh, for now i will sk skip the topography um, uh, pictures over here but i will go directly to the standard deviations um, here and this is actually my eyes and i was in a different country i was presenting um, in a large group some years back uh, in Dubai and I thought that my vision was not great and the hall that I was presenting uh, for continuously for three to four days it was a large hall it was a mystic you know lighting condition and I, I it seemed that I was not actually seeing clear I could see things I mean six by six but it seemed that somewhere it was uh, you know I, it, the, my vision was not actually clear I came back to Bangalore I went to a large hospital they looked into my eyes and they said that you know the it's your your vision is perfectly fine you have a six by six vision uh there's no trouble with your eyes but there might be some trouble with your brain <laughs> so uh, you know i was not happy with that answer and therefore i went to one of my friend's place and he had this diagnostic machines so uh, he had the pentagram and i wanted to do the pentagram and see what uh, what is it in the is it because of dry eyes is it because of the cornea but before I did, I, I checked uh, my, you know, the uh, data in the lens star and I just wanted to see what is it over here. And if you see uh, in the in the lens star, uh, the axis standard deviation here is 7.2 degrees. Which is more than double than what is this, what, what is acceptable. As I said, the standard deviation of the axis should be always less than 3.5 degrees. The variant was continuously showing me a corneal power, which was, you know, here, this, uh, the corneal uh, power was continuously yellow. It was not green. And I knew there was must be something wrong, I mean, uh, with my eyes. So I did a pentacam over here. And if you can see this pentacam report over here, on the sagittal curvature over here, on the sagittal, this report over here, this, this dashed ring that you find over here, this dashed ring over here, is basically my pupil diameters within this dash ring there's not much of an astigmatism but and you can see this line over here is quite straight but in a mesopic condition in a mesopic condition when this uh, pupil gets dilated this broken lines comes in and this broken lines indicate in the pentacam that i have some sort of an irregularity Again, that irregularity in session one, we were talking about it could be structural, it could be because of dry eyes, but I say that it may be more because of the dry eyes because I don't have much of an astigmatism of only 0.5 to 0.75 diopters. And you know, with very low diopters of astigmatism, amounts of astigmatism, this could often be, you know, uh, irregularity caused by some form of dry eyes, which is, which maybe in my case is largely asymptomatic so it's so important basically to understand the standard deviations in this case the standard deviations of the axis you know you can see over here 6.8 degrees very high again uh, the standard deviation here is 40 uh, is 3.3 .3 degrees standard deviation uh, on the left over here is uh, sorry uh, my cursor is not working very well over here it is 40.2 degrees so you can well understand basically that it's important to see the standard deviations before we jump on to a toric lens otherwise we can learn we can go into a refractive surprise right so rule eight is basically always check the standard deviations one of the other things is uh, the is uh, to see the pupil diameters you know uh, pupil is very important you know uh, there could be afferent pupillary defects you know and if you are implanting a multifocal eye you else you want to see that the, at the least the pupil diameters of the two eyes are very closely matching each other you don't want a pupil diameter 
in the left and the right eye to be totally different. I mean, more than one millimeter of difference uh, in the pupil diameters. You also want a reactive pupil, and you can test the patients with the shining uh, pupil, uh, you know, torch light to see the reactiveness of the pupil because most of these lenses are diffractive lenses. In fact, if not all these lenses are diffractive lenses, so they need some amount of, you know, a healthy pupillary function to give the patient the right, uh, you know, uh, vision. Otherwise, your patients, you might attend 6 by 6 or 20 by 20, but your patients might land up with a refractive, uh, you know, with, uh, with halos and glares with this photopsias. All right, so we will again continue uh, with this, uh, you know, the, the, the sessions. Uh, and uh, uh, this was the biometry session two. We will talk more about other aspects of biometry in, uh, in biometry session three. Um, thank you very much uh, for your patient listening. Thank you. We'll see you again.